on October 4, 1918, a massive explosion tore through the building 611 of the T.A. Gillespie shell loading plant in the Morgan area of Sayreville, New Jersey. The munitions plant building, which was heavily staffed to produce munitions for World War I, was flattened, killing everyone inside. Worse still, the fire was quickly spreading to the other buildings in the compound, which were equally bustling with activity and stocked with enough explosives to cause severe damage as far away as its neighboring state of New York. The clock was ticking for more than 1,000 workers at the loading plant and the surrounding community. The gunpowder manufacturing industry had deep roots in this area of the country. Dating as far back as 1805, the locals were well aware of the hazardous nature of the business. Many 19th century stories exist of gunpowder explosions maiming and killing those who worked with the volatile substance. Intense care was taken in the handling of it, but mishaps were not only prepared for, they were expected. Just 13 years prior to the event at the T.A. Gillespie shell loading plant, on November 21, 1905, an explosion occurred at International Smokeless Powder Company in Sayreville, killing four. Though the dangers were well known, disasters relating to the industry peaked at a time when the nation was at war. During World War I, the munitions field was in full effect supplying the troops overseas. Of course, the increase in production alone should be expected to lead to more mishaps due to the sheer volume of the material being handled. And an increase it certainly was. The demand for munitions was almost unachievably high. However, outside of normal occupational dangers, there was another serious concern. Sabotage. The fear was so great that munitions plants in Middlesex County, which employed a total of 5,000 workers, were secured by armed guards. One well-known event that is frequently considered the work of saboteurs was a train derailment on July 31, 1915. The train car was carrying munition workers to work at the powder plants. Spikes left on the tracks caused the train to derail. While a few were injured in the crash, fortunately, none were killed. There were a number of other events that also created concern that sabotage was taking place. One significant example was an explosion in Eddystone, Pennsylvania on April 10, 1917, which took the lives of 139 individuals and injured more than a hundred others. It should be noted that while many disasters at the time were attributed to work of saboteurs, it's difficult to say for sure which were and which of them were simply accidents. There was certainly good reason to believe that these events were done intentionally as acts of sabotage, and several of them actually were. But some people push back on the notion stating that many mishaps were the result of poor working conditions and that sabotage was a convenient scapegoat for businesses. Regardless of the reason, the loss of life that resulted from these disasters was nothing short of tragic. On that autumn evening in 1918, catastrophe would strike again on a large scale. It was 7.40 p.m. when a violent explosion shook the grounds the resulting inferno raced toward the plant's other buildings. Quick action was needed. The plant's fire company arrived in just a few minutes to battle the fire, but their hopes were quickly dashed. When the firemen connected their hose to the fire hydrant, it only produced 10 pounds of pressure, well short of the expected 116 to 290 psi. There was insufficient pressure in the hose to create an adequate stream of water to fight the blaze. The first explosion likely burst the water supply pipe to the plant's fire hydrant. The explosion also knocked out power to the entire plant. In complete darkness and with no water, 
the impossible struggle began. It was obvious that the first building was a complete loss, so the firefighters switched their focus onto building 621. As they advanced toward it, however, a second, more violent explosion occurred, throwing the first responders 15 feet backwards. Subsequent explosions became more frequent, forcing rescue to retreat. It had quickly become far too dangerous to enter the area. Firefighters from surrounding towns rushed to the plant. However, they were also stopped due to the immense danger of the situation. The only people who were allowed into the scenes were clergy. It was pure chaos. Buildings of the plant entirely demolished. Survivors retreating into the surrounding swamps, making their way to the nearby highways. Explosions echoed through the darkness, while priests administered last rites to the dying victims of the blast. As luck would have it, the Coast Guard station nearby quickly became aware of the situation and rushed into action. 75 Coast Guardsmen from Perth Amboy made it to the scene in no time. More than a hundred additional members of the Coast Guard were summoned from Staten Island, New York and other surrounding areas to aid in the disaster. They quickly took control. Putting themselves in extreme danger, they evacuated nearby homes, tended to the wounded, towed away the Coast Guard barges that were in harm's way, and perhaps most heroically, removed a train fully loaded with TNT from directly in the path of destruction. In fact, the train was so close to the event that the rail had been damaged by the explosion and had to be repaired before the train could be moved. That evening, they displayed tremendous bravery, witnessing death firsthand and being bombarded with exploding shells. They persevered, working diligently throughout the night and well into the following day, likely saving countless lives in the endeavor. The explosions were immense. Homes and businesses were damaged up to 10 miles from the plant. The day following the event, as the flames were still spreading, a plane piloted by airmail aviator Robert Shank left an airfield in Philadelphia to survey the damage. In his own words, upon reaching the location, he was met with a massive column of thick, greenish-colored smoke. He described the scene in further detail that conveyed the dread of the situation. The roads between South River and South Amboy seemed as busy as Fifth Avenue. They were black with people. Hundreds of autos were racing along in both directions. With a following wind, I was making perhaps 120 miles an hour. In two or three minutes, I was flying over what the day before was the world's largest TNT shell plant at an altitude of 4,000 feet. The place was unrecognizable. The whole 8 square miles that the plant covered was one vast volcanic crater of dull red flames, bursting shells and bright flashes as one magazine after another went sky high. Big, cavernous holes told where a magazine or shop once stood. Between me and the earth was a ragged bank of vile smoke. In all, approximately 100 people died in this disaster, and more than 100 others were injured. 325 of the plant's 700 buildings were destroyed. The explosions left several enormous craters, a few 25 and 35 feet wide, but one crater, caused by the detonation of 1 million pounds of ammonium nitrate, left a crater about 150 feet wide and 30 feet deep. It was not just the T.A. Gillespie plant that was damaged, however. The entire city had felt the effects. The evening of the explosion, the entire city eventually evacuated. Upon their return, they found that most houses were structurally sound, but were missing windows and had noticeable superficial damage. The Red Cross coordinated assistance to the devastated city. Churches, police stations, schools, 
railroad stations, a previously abandoned hotel, and other such buildings in the community were set up to provide temporary housing for the more than 1,000 dislocated citizens. As the catastrophe took place at the same time as the infamous Spanish flu pandemic, severe illness was a significant concern for the crowds of the newly homeless. This disease would add insult to injury as a number of dislocated families became infected and several died as a result. While the Red Cross provided much needed aid to the needy in the area, they were forced to divide their attention a few short weeks later, on November 1st, 1918, to focus on a severe subway crash in Brooklyn, a crash which would become known as the Malbone Street Wreck, one of the worst rail disasters in the history of the United States. Immediately following the disaster, investigations took place to find the cause. Rumors of sabotage spread quickly. It did not seem out of the realm of possibility, as a German national saboteur had already been arrested and sentenced to prison for a previous attempt at sneaking in matches and attempting to detonate the plant. However, it was quickly determined that it was worker error, which was not surprising, as the plant's construction and operation were set up hastily to serve the war effort. Most of the workers were greatly inexperienced. Although there were immediate plans to quickly rebuild the plant, they were cancelled shortly after as the war came to an end just a month after the explosion. This, however, created a new problem. The munitions sent overseas now had to be returned to the US. 18 carloads of defective shells were shipped to the plant with the intention of them being stored in the undamaged warehouse. Senator Thomas J. Scully, who was a South Amboy local, was vehemently against the arrangement and pushed back. Despite the significant efforts to clean up the area, the dangers of hidden and unexploded ordnance would be a terrible danger for decades to come. This issue would trigger a number of cleanup initiatives in 1994, 1997, and another nearly a century later in 2007. In each of the occasions, unexploded ordnance were found near elementary schools. In 1994 and 1997, they were found near Sayreville's Dwight D. Eisenhower Elementary School, and in 2007, near Samsel Upper Elementary School. Chillingly, the latter was discovered when workers were building the school's playground. While this significant piece of history has largely been forgotten and little information is available about the disaster, much of the information in this video was sourced from a book called Explosion at Morgan, the World War I Middlesex Munitions Disaster, which was written by local historians Frank Yusko and Randall Gabrielin. I do not know the authors personally, and this is not a paid advertisement, but I highly recommend reading it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you liked it and subscribed to my channel for more content like this. Until next time.